ourselves, not to wander from you, but to cling to you, Lord God. For you are our source of life, our source of light, our source of love. You are our everything. And Lord, help us to desire more and more of you and less and less of ourselves because you're the one who brings true joy. You're the one who fills our lives with abundant life. Lord, each of us has sought our, our joys and pleasures in life in our own way. And where does that get us? Nothing but sorrow. But Lord, we look to you. Help us to encourage each other, to bless each other, to be filled with you, to be filled with your spirit. Fill us each now, Lord God. And help us to be open to your word, that we might learn from you. That we might sit at your feet as Mary did and learn from you. So Lord, we look to you now. Open our hearts and our minds to your word. And help us to do what you want us to do. To focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to share with you uh, the title for this message. Uh, and the purpose of it is to engage you in something greater that our church desires to do. But then what I want to share with you this morning is telling others about Jesus and why we need to do it. Uh, I want to tie this message to a unique opportunity for us in this church uh, to be trained and equipped. And it's to be trained and equipped so that we can share Christ with the lost. Now, whenever I make the statement, share Christ with the lost, a lot of you have just experienced anxiety within your soul. You're thinking to yourself, I actually have to go out and speak to people about Jesus. You know, it kind of brings some tension within your heart. But think about it. There's a lot of things that we get scared about. For instance, the first day on a job, we're pretty nervous. We're anxious about what's going to happen. Maybe it's the first day of school. Maybe you have an interview. Uh, maybe you have to confront someone. You have to meet with someone. But... Here's something that we do as human beings, we still go ahead and do it. Why? Because this is something that we need to do in order to get to the next step. But when it comes to sharing Christ with others, we hesitate. We make all the excuses in the world as to why we cannot share Jesus, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the information, and yet this is what God is calling us to do. And here's why I want to share this with you, and that's why I broke away a little bit from my, my message in Revelation. It's because our church is going to have a unique opportunity to train you and equip you so that you can have confidence in sharing the Word of God. And here's why I think this is so important for us to be engaged in this fight. Uh, because there is a massive change that is happening before our, our very eyes. For instance, here's what I want to share with you, and many of you might be familiar with this already. You'll notice here that this says 33 million people have no religion. These are stats concerning America. It means about one in five Americans, they have no religious affiliation. So this equals about 33 million people in America, and of those 33 million people, 13 to 15 million of them identify themselves as atheists or agnostic. Now I want you to think about this for a second. This is the fastest growing demographic in America today. People that don't go to church, don't go to any type of religious services, but this is what is happening in our culture by and large. So if you think that there are problems in our country today and you're sick of thinking to yourself, I can't believe this is happening, imagine when people that have no Christian worldview continue to increase in our population. This has increased, uh, some people estimate that religious, uh, people with no religious affiliation, some people estimate that it has increased about 25% in the last five to ten years. So this is not the good old America, you know, where we have Christian values and after church, you know, we go to a meal at Cracker Barrel and everybody in Cracker Barrel is a Christian and we go to our local stores. No. All around you, there are people that are lost on their way to hell and eternal damnation and the only thing that is stopping them from going there is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what you and I need to be passionate about, and this is what I want to share with you. And there's multiple verses that I want to go through to make it bring about the greater point. Here's something else that I want to share with you. Look at this next slide here. What is interesting is these statistics, it says that 75% of Christians, they feel comfortable sharing their belief in Christ with someone else. But here is what is startling about these statistics. It says that 61% have not shared how to become a Christian with anyone in the past six months. 48% have not invited anyone to church in the past six months. 20% rarely or never pray for people who are not professing Christians. But 80% agree that they have personal responsibility to share their religious beliefs about Christ with non-Christians. So understand that there's a disconnect. That in these statistics, when people were asked, 
Do you feel that you need to share Christ? And are you comfortable? They have this utmost confidence like, yeah, I can do it. But when it actually comes time to put your feet, uh, feet to the test and to walk out there and to speak with someone, they absolutely crumble. Why does that happen? Because Christ has called us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to every single person. So it is a responsibility for all believers. And what I want to share with you is why do we even need the gospel and the importance of sharing the gospel. Look at Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. Isaiah, when he's confronted with the glory of God, you know, Isaiah is a prophet. He's out there and, you know, he's preaching God's righteousness and holiness. And then he gets a glimpse of who God is. And Isaiah realizes that he himself is a sinner. He is someone who's also in need of God's mercy and grace. And then in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. I pray that this is the prayer of every single person in this room. That you would look to God, that you would acknowledge that you are saved by His grace, and that you would use the words of Isaiah where he says, Here am I, Lord, send me. I'm willing to go out. I want to go out and share the gospel. I want to tell people about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. So why do we need to share the gospel? Remember, I'm going to go through multiple verses here. be a little bit different this morning. But why do we need to share the gospel? Look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Every single one of us knows this as the Great Commission. Jesus, right before he ascends into heaven, he meets with his disciples, and look at what he says. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In that one verse, I want to focus on just verse 19, and the first word in verse 19 is the word go. Why should we share the gospel? Why do we need to do it? Because Christ has commanded for us to go. And I love the, the acronym that I've come up for, go, is get out. Right? Get out. Because every one of us loves our comfort zones, right? We like our own little bubbles. We don't want to be disturbed. We don't want to be, you know, someone to inconvenience us. But the Bible is very clear that Jesus tells us that if we are followers of Christ, he's telling us to go, to get out. Go out where? Go into all the world. Go out where lost people gather together. Folks, the option of going or not is not really something where we look and say, well, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't. No, this is what Christ has commanded for us to do. He has called for us to go out and proclaim the gospel. So we need to share the gospel so that we can be obedient to Jesus Christ, not stay in our rooms, read our Bibles, until Jesus returns. But why do we even need the gospel? Well, what is the purpose of the gospel? What exactly are we trying to communicate to a lost and dying world around us? For instance, how it used to be, look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It's astounding when you read verse 31 in chapter 1, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. We can see from creation that it, it shows God's perfect character. That if God is perfect, God is holy, God is creative, we see this in what he has created. Everything was good, it was perfect. Adam and Eve, they had a perfect relationship with God. Imagine that for a second. Imagine having a perfect relationship with God. There was no sin in the world, but everything was changed when sin entered into the world. God warned Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. It says, he took, The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. He was an eternal being. But God warned Adam that if you disobey me, there would be physical and spiritual consequences to your sin. Physically, you would die. You would experience what it means to truly die because of sin. But not just that, you would die spiritually. That there would be a separation between God and man. It was perfect that God told him, if you disobey me, this is what is going to happen. But look at what happens very quickly in Genesis 3. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, 
And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. How quickly things changed. They go from having a perfect relationship with God, they're talking with God, they're walking with God, and the moment disobedience takes place, what God had told Adam that there would be physical and spiritual consequences, they get to see the result of it where they realize that they are naked, they are shameful, they are ashamed of what they have done. Sin changed everything. It changed your relationship, my relationship with God. And look at Romans 5.12. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sin. It is amazing to us, the Bible is telling us that we are born with a sin nature. You know, when you have a child, a newborn child, and then you hold it for the first time, what do you say? Oh, she's, she or he, I, all I know is she in my house, okay? I've never said the word he in my house, okay? Just being honest with you, all right? So, so, you, just, so you, just, you look at the baby and you say, she's so perfect. You know, look at her beautiful hair and look at, you know, you, you, you lift up your child, you know, because you're so blessed and happy about it. But at the end of the day, what you don't realize and what you should realize is that they are born with a sin nature. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you had a school session with your children and taught them how to sin? It comes very naturally to them. Why is it? Because they are descendants of Adam. So we are born with a sin nature that is drawn towards sin. We like to sin. It makes us happy. And there's constant tension. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There isn't a single person on this earth that measures up to the mark that God has set. Everyone misses the mark. That's what it means to sin. Every single person has fallen short of the glory of God. So when you look at this room, when you look at this world today, everyone is equally a sinner before God and in deserving of God's judgment. But what I find amazing is in Genesis 3.21, that after Adam and Eve sinned, that it says, For Adam and his wife, the Lord God, made tunics of skin and clothed them. They were naked. And then more than likely, God sacrificed an animal, and with the animal's skin, he closed Adam and Eve. And it was a beautiful picture of what would take place with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, he would be slain. And because of our trust in him, uh, through our faith in him, repenting of our sins, that we would be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Sin changed everything. Sin, sin has had a tremendous impact in our personal lives, in the world around us. It, it, is, it is a consequential thing because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. When you read the Old Testament, what do you see? You see sacrifice. You look at the history of the Jewish people, what do they do all the time? They're sacrificing. Why do they sacrifice? Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. It says, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Imagine for a second the people of Israel during the time of the Passover, the Day of Atonement, when they are gathering together and they're having their assembly meeting, there is an animal that is sacrificed, and when they look at this animal, they are reminded that this animal is sacrificed because of their sin. This is the history of the Old Testament. It is sin and redemption, sin and redemption. And the author of Hebrews is telling us that no matter how many sacrifices these people did over and over again, it could not take care of the heart. It is the same way with you and I. You can say, you know what, I'm going to go to church a lot of times. I'm going to try to read my Bible. I'm going to try to listen to Christian music. I'm going to do charity work. But the Bible is telling us external things will never save you from your sin. It is only the blood of Christ that will cleanse you from your sin. That is the message of Scripture, that we are never going to be worthy, no matter how many good works we do. It will never satisfy the wrath of God, because Christ is the only one who satisfied the wrath of God because He was the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. This is the history, this is the story of the Old Testament. However, there is a permanent solution. There is a permanent solution, and the permanent solution is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' birth narrative in Matthew 121, it says about Mary, it says, And she will bring forth a son... And you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people 
from their sins. Why did Jesus come to this earth? Yes, he showed us a great example of what it means to serve people, to love people, to reach the outcast. But there was one particular reason that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped into history was so that he could offer redemption to fallen people. That's you and I. That's every single person who has ever lived. Because we struggle with sin, we are, on, we are on the edge of eternity, of going into uh, eternity without knowing Christ, separated from God and His people forever, and Jesus steps into history. And what is His purpose? Look at Luke 19.10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to see and to save that which was lost. At some point or another, many of us who are Christians in this room, at some point, you and I were lost. We were walking away from the purposes and the plans of God. We were doing our own thing. We were thinking that we were okay, but we reached a point where we realized that we were sinners in need of God's grace, and God saved us. That is why Jesus came, to seek and to save those who are lost. Look at Matthew 5, 31 and 32. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Hey, at some point or another, all of us have been sick, right? None of us like to be ill. We know what a horrible feeling that is. But until you know Christ as your Savior, you have a spiritual sickness. You, you will continue to struggle with sin. You will continue to struggle with all the bad habits in your life. You will continue to be disobedient to Christ until you trust in Him, if you want, until you repent of your sin, and you realize that He has done this on your behalf. This is why Jesus came. What did He do? 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. says, Who Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Romans 4.25 Jesus was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Here's something that I realize when I look at these two verses regarding human beings, is that we like to do things on our own, right? When someone asks us for help, we don't like to say, yeah, I need help. I want to do my own thing. You know, I, I'm okay. You know, I can fix this on my own. I have this issue. I'm going to take care of it. You know, I need to fix something in my house or whatever. I can take care of it. Whatever it is, we like to do our own thing. We don't like someone offering us help because there's an aspect of pride that is built into our hearts. But look at what Jesus does here. He says, he's looking at us. He's saying no amount of good works is going to get you into heaven. No amount of good things that you try to do will ever offer you know, the cleansing of your soul from your sin. It is only Jesus who takes our sin upon himself. And when we trust in him through faith, are we justified? Are we made right before God? This is the message of scripture over and over again. You and I will never measure up to God's holiness. But it is when we are imputed the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we are given a clean slate and we are made perfect before God. Can I tell you that one day when you enter into heaven, Jesus is not going to look at you because if he looks at you, you've got a problem. You are in some major trouble. But, but if God looks at Christ in you and he sees the righteousness of Christ, that is the only qualification that is needed to get into heaven. It is the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. That is what the Bible proclaims over and over again. How are we saved from our sins? Look at Romans 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised them from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Bible tells us there is a problem, that we are eternally separated from God. We have a sin nature. We like to sin. We like to indulge in sin. But God steps into history in the person of Jesus Christ. He offers himself on the cross. He's buried and he rises again. 
And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And those who trust in him are forgiven of their sins. This is a permanent solution to our sin problem. So if we have this information, if we realize that all people are guilty before God, and the only thing that can save them is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if we realize that heaven is real, and if we realize equally that hell is real, that eternal damnation and fire is real, why are we not telling people about the life-saving message of Jesus Christ? Do we truly take it seriously? Yeah, God saved me. I'm on my way to heaven. This is good news. No matter what happens to me, I'm on my way to heaven. Praise God for that. But what about your neighbor? What about your co-worker or the person that you sit next to at school? Whoever they are, the person at the grocery store, what about them? Should we not be concerned about their souls in the same way that Christ was concerned about our soul, that he would give himself on our behalf? Folks, this is honestly what I want to challenge you with. Because I've noticed, here's something that I've noticed living in Southeast Indiana, I've been here about 14 years, is that folks around here are shy. Right? People around here are shy. If you move them from outside, people are generally shy. They don't want to talk to people. They don't want to offend people. Everybody knows who they are. But can I tell you, we have to get to a point where we stop worrying about offending people and start being obedient to Jesus and saying they need to know the gospel. This is what we are called to do. Let me focus the rest of my time on 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21 because there is a gospel mandate. Not a gospel option, not a gospel where I pray whether or not I share Jesus. There is a gospel mandate that is given to us. Look at Paul in his second letter, chapter 5, look at what he says. He says, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Now look at these word, words, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and look again at these words, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, who? We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Are those not powerful words? To us has been entrusted the gospel. To us as believers has been given and entrusted the message of reconciliation. In the same way that God reconciled us to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ, it is through us that we are able to share the gospel, and the gospel reconciles sinful humanity back to God. These are powerful words, but there is a gospel mandate. Here's what I want to challenge you with in these few moments. And I told you this was a little bit different, but this is an opportunity for you to get involved in a particular aspect that I think is important for any church. But let me share with you a few points here that will help you out regarding this passage. Number one, sharing the gospel isn't an option for the believer. Now that's tough, isn't it? Sharing the gospel isn't an option for the believer. We live in a world today where we have a lot of options. You know, my wife and I, you know, we have Netflix. Uh, you know, someone got us uh, something for him from Amazon, and you know you can get all these shows. But what's amazing is that there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows, and we don't know what to watch. We're going, should we start this show? Should we start this series? What should we do? And then we sit there and watch the same thing that we can't stand watching, right? That's what we do. We, we live in a world that there are tons of options. You go to the drive-thru, you've got eight different things, you know, what can you select? You go and you try to Wendy's and they've got hundreds of drinks, which one do you select? We live in a world of options. We can pick and choose what we want to do. But can I tell you, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing the good news isn't an option for the believer. You can't opt out of it. <coughs> 
Because if Jesus has saved you, and He has redeemed you from eternal damnation in hell, we are so thankful to God that He has saved our soul, we cannot help but share the good news of Jesus Christ. It should come naturally to us. You know why it doesn't come naturally to us? Because we don't fill our hearts with God's passion and desire. Some people might say, well, I just don't really have a passion to share Jesus. Can I tell you, the more you are in the Word of God, God will bring about that passion in your heart. The more time I spend with Him, the more that I'm praying, the more that I see the heart of Jesus and how He goes out and seeks the lost and desires to reconcile them, the more I fill my heart with God's heart, the more I will be able to see people for who they are, sinners lost without a Savior. Sharing the gospel isn't an option for the believer. So if you're sitting here in this room today and saying, well, this is not my thing, you know, I'm better at something else. No, we are all called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's going to look different. Conversations will look different. Approaches will look different. But at the end of the day, it isn't an option for the believer. Number two, when we share the gospel, we are being obedient. When we share the gospel, we are being obedient. You know, how, many people say, well, how do I know that I'm being obedient to Jesus Christ? Well, we know that we can read His Word. We know that we can pray. We know that we can attend church and Bible studies. But another way that we can be obedient is by telling others about Jesus. So when I, as a child of God, been filled by the Spirit of God, and I'm in fellowship with the people of God, I'm being challenged by the people of God, when I'm going out and sharing the gospel, I am being obedient to what Jesus is calling me to do and to be. Folks, there's a lot of things that we're passionate about and things that we like to talk about. Many of us in this room don't hesitate when it comes to share, talking to people about politics. That's very easy for a lot of us. If we want to talk to people about sports, it's very easy for us. Hey, what are you doing on the weekend? We can talk about it with strangers, no problem. But when it comes to talking about Jesus, we cringe. We get anxious. I don't know what, what works to say. I don't know what to do, Lord. But realize that when we share the gospel, we are being obedient. If you want to be obedient to Jesus Christ, we must share the gospel. Number three, this is important for us to understand. In the work of the gospel, we get to join in the work God is already doing. When we share the gospel, we get to join in the work that God is already doing. Folks, here's what I want to challenge you with. When you look at our world today, it's a broken world, right? It's a broken world because of sin. It is a cursed world. We live in a broken world with broken people that have broken lives, and the only thing that can change that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's what's amazing about this, is that when I think about the work that God is doing around the world, God is doing His great work in the places that you and I would never think. You know, when we look at a world map, when you turn on your television, you know, you look at Iraq, you look at Syria, you look at Iran, you look at North Korea, you look at China, you look at all these nations where Christianity is closed up. You know, it's almost like God is saying, go ahead, could ban Christianity. And he's saying, you know what, go ahead, outlaw Christianity, ban Bibles, do all these things. I am God, I can do my work in some of the darkest places in the world. And when you and I uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we are involved in the work of the ministry, we're not starting something new. We're not starting a new movement. We simply get to join in the work that God is already doing. You know what's amazing about it? God uses us. God chooses to use us. Look at your own life. Look at the mess that you're in sometimes. Look at the things that you have done. Look at your past. Look at your history. Look at all of these crazy things that we have done. And yet, when I think about God's grace, He wants to use me? Yes. Because that's God's plan. God's plan is to use broken people to reach a broken world. We wouldn't do it that way. We would take people that have it all together. They've got Bible verses memorized, you know. They've got a nice life. They read their Bibles. They're involved in every activity at church. Those are the people that I want to use. But God says, no, I want to take broken people that have broken hearts, and I want to use them to reach a broken world. So when you are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, when even when you give financially towards church, 
Think about this. You're, you're taking part in the work that God is already doing. God started His work in eternity past. His work will continue into eternity future. And we simply get to be one minuscule dot in all of history where we get to take part in God's plan. It all has to do with what God is doing. It's not my plan. It's what, what God has already ordained from eternity past. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's a challenging uh, couple of verses. Look at verses 5 through 8. Because there were contentions in the church. Some people were saying, well, I'm following Apollos. Some are saying, I'm going to follow Paul. And they're having this you know, tension back and forth. But look at what Paul says. He says, who then is Paul and who is Ap Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. Paul says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I love that verse. You know what it tells me? Is that every Christian can do something. You can't simply step back and say, well, that's not my strength. You know, that's not what I'm good at. How do you know if you don't do it? You know, your, your, your flesh is always fighting you and saying, you know, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't talk to people. But how do you know unless you aren't involved in that work, unless you step out in faith and try it? Paul is saying, you guys are making a big deal. You're saying you're going to follow Paul or Apollos. And Paul is saying, we are nobodies. God has simply entrusted us this gift of sharing the gospel, but it is God who gives the increase. So if you're sitting in this room today and you're saying, you know what, I don't have those talents, I don't have those gifts, God is saying, that's not what I'm asking you for. I'm asking you for you. Let me build you up. Let me increase that confidence in your heart so that you can serve me. Here's the point. We are called to be faithful. God will take care of the rest. You know what we do? We say, I want to make sure that everything is taken care of and then I'll be faithful. And God is saying, that's not how it works. He's asking us to be faithful and He will take care of the rest. Here's my other follow-up question for you. If we don't share the gospel in our sphere of influence, then who will? You realize that where God has placed you is your mission field. Now, you might be saying to yourself, now, wait a minute, you know, I thought missionaries were those who go to foreign lands, they learn the languages, they assimilate in the culture, and they share the gospel. Yeah, they're missionaries. But do you realize every single Christian is a missionary? If you're a believer sitting in this room today, when you walk out, you need to realize you're a missionary for the kingdom of God. So where God has placed you in your sphere of influence, maybe it's three people, maybe it's ten, maybe it's a hundred, but that is your mission field, and God has placed you in the very middle, and if God has surrounded you with all of these lost people, if you as a missionary of God do not reach them, then who will? You don't have the option of opting out. God has placed you there for a specific reason. You might not be able to stand the people that you work around. I know that's no one in this room because you all probably work with great people, right? Good, I got a little bit of sarcastic laughter, right? You, you may not be able to stand the people that you work around, but ask yourself this question. Do they know Jesus? And if they don't, I have been placed here. I have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation. God, what do you desire for me to do more than just work a job? And God is saying, I desire that you would reach them with the life-changing message of the gospel. You don't have an option. Am I going to be obedient to what God has entrusted me and called me to do in me? God is calling me to be faithful and He will take care of the rest. Now, I love this next one. When it comes to sharing the gospel, here's, I love this phrase that people use. Here we go. Here's what it says. People say, I'm not good with talking with people. I'm not good with talking with people. I don't know what words to say. I don't know how to share the gospel. You know, and that's part of the reason we want to train and equip you. But you may say to yourself, I'm not good with talking to people. And the same people that say that, when they have conversations with other people, I've watched them, they're chatterboxes, okay? <laughs> they talk a lot. I know what talking a lot is like because I live with five daughters. They talk a lot, right? 
But think about this for a second here. We may make an excuse and say, I'm not good with talking with people. That's not my gift. I want to challenge you on that. If you say that you're not good with talking with people, and that's your best excuse, I have a great passage in Scripture for you. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Remember, God comes to Moses and says, go tell the people of Israel, they're going to come out of Egypt, go talk to Pharaoh, and he makes all these excuses. And look at Moses, God's prophet, look at what he says. Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow tongue. Anyone make that excuse? Look at what God says. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Wow. If you're sitting in this room right now and you're saying, I'm not good with talking with people, I don't know what to say, your excuse has been completely obliterated because God told Moses, I'll tell you exactly what to say. And when it comes to sharing the gospel, you might be nervous, but when you do it, I guarantee you, God will tell you exactly what to say. This is the power of the gospel. Folks, you see the tension that we have? The tension that we have is trusting in God and then trusting my own abilities. And my trusting my own abilities and strengths starts to outweigh what God can do. But unless you step out and allow God to work in your life, you'll never know the power of His presence in your life. When you share the gospel, is it always going to be rosy? It'd be great if we just went up to someone and said, you know what, Jesus died for your sins, and if you trusted Him as your Savior, repent of your sins, you're on your way to heaven. Yes, I want to repent right now. Well, that'd be great if that's the way it was. But that's not always the way that it is. Just because someone rejects you, don't think for a second that you haven't planted a seed in your heart. Go back again. It is God who brings about the increase. We plant, we water, but that's what God does. God brings the increase. So if we say to ourselves, well, I have all these excuses, you know, I'm not good at talking to people about the gospel, so on and so forth. God says that I will go with you. When we are sharing the gospel, we need to remember that God's presence is always with us. In the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, what does Jesus say? I am with you always. You don't do it alone. You might go with a friend from church and share the gospel with someone. But at the end of the day, we need to realize when we're going and sharing the gospel, it is the power of God working in us and through us, and we have the presence of God that is always with us. I think sometimes Christians think that after they leave church that God's presence stays here and then we just leave. That's kind of how we operate. Oh, I'm going to meet God next Sunday back in church. No, if you're a believer, He's always going to be with you. His presence is always going to be there. So when it comes to sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, He is always going to be with us. There is a gospel mandate. And there's a gospel mandate because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God can use you and I. The question is, am I willing to take that step? Every single one of us is scared when, we come to, when it comes to sharing the gospel or doing something. But unless you do it, how will you truly know if you're going to be good at it or not? Unless you take a step of faith, how will you know? Unless you take a step of faith, how will you know that you won't experience a greater presence of God? The, the biggest hindrance is that pride in our life that says, or that excuse that says, I don't think I can do it. Put that in God's hands. And it'd be amazing what God will do in and through you. We're going to have a, a short skit here, and then I'm going to have TC share more about this ministry. Hi, Mrs. Smith. How are you doing? I'm here to see Eric. Are you having lunch again? I haven't seen Eric come through the lobby yet. He came into work last week with a bad hangover. Probably the same thing that's happened today. How was church? It was really good. We had Brother Don Waterdowns come in and give a series of miracle services. Um, lots of people gave their heart to the Lord. I'm in charge of the follow-up program. I didn't realize how easy it is to get people saved. Lots were getting blessed, and people were coming to the altar without even getting preached to. 
What a blessing. We had him at our church. He advocates the non-confrontational friendship evangelism. Yes, I like that. That's what I'm using with Eric. Uh, we've become good buddies over the years. I like that approach, too. It is so much better than shoving the gospel down people's throats. And true. That can alienate them. I'm waiting for the right time to bring up the subject of God with Eric. It's been two years now. <laughs> I don't want to make him feel uncomfortable. Uh, Eric came to one of the meetings, and he really seemed to have a good time. That's the good thing about non-confrontational evangelism. Maybe today he'll bring up the subject. I never do because I don't want to offend him. I'm just a good friend, and I think that's the right approach. I agree. I'll call his secretary, and perhaps she'll know why he's late. Okay, thanks. Sure. Jeannie, Chris Smith here. Um, is Eric in? Christian Loveless is here to see him. <laughs> what? What's wrong? Your face has turned pale. I'm afraid Eric died in the night. He had an aneurysm in his sleep and was pronounced dead at 8.17 this morning. by Living Waters. It's DVD-driven. Uh, it's called The Way of the Master's Evangelism. And it's led by Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron. You may have seen them on TV. They're going to teach us how to share our faith by bypassing our intellect, which is the place of argument in our brain. And will teach us how to speak directly to our conscience, which is where God placed the knowledge of right. Believe me, when I finish, when you finish this class, you'll be prepared to share your faith with confidence the way Jesus does. We'll celebrate our victories together as a team, as a family. And we'll encourage each other when we fail or think we didn't do such a good job. You're going to build a lot of friendships in this class. Believe me when I say this, this is a great class. You don't want to miss it. You really don't. So think about it. April 11th, two Wednesdays after Easter. Sign up. I'll be in the foyer to take your name and email address right after church. Thanks, DC. <laughs> take part in it, guys. You never know what God can do in and through you, but every single one of us, if you say, I don't know how to share the gospel, this is a great way to learn. And you'll get to learn from others. You'll find out that they have the same fears. Uh, as you do, and every single person should be involved in sharing the gospel. Thank you, TC, for uh, leading that ministry. Let me share with you a few others. By the way, I, what is this phone? At least I didn't have the... All right, never mind. All right, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, remember our Bible studies uh, on Wednesday evening. Our guys will meet at 6.30 in the morning also uh, this coming Wednesday. 
Uh, next uh, Saturday, uh, starting at 9 o'clock, 9.30, you're going to have Defending the Resurrection Conference. If you signed up for that, uh, we're going to provide a meal for you as well for, uh, during the lunchtime. Uh, if you were kind of like last minute, you know, we were still deciding, please sign up on the sheet in the back. The front is completely full. As well as our breakfast on April the 1st, uh, please sign up in terms of what you would like to bring if, uh, for food for that morning. Again, if you haven't signed up for that, our front sheets are full, so put your name uh, towards the back. That would be greatly appreciated. If you're full to a first-time guest with us here this morning, thank you for coming and visiting uh, at Cross Point Church. Please fill out a card for us. We have a small gift for you, and we hope and, uh, you come and worship with us uh, once again. Let's stand as we dismiss in a word of prayer. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you for a tremendous worship, Father, uh, opportunity to listen to your word. Father, thank you for uh, this skit, Father, that's a great reminder to us uh, that we need to stop being concerned about offending people, and we just need to lovingly and with much grace uh, share you with those that you have placed around us. Uh, Father, I thank you that uh, TC is going to be leading this class. Lord, I pray that you would challenge people's hearts in this room, uh, that they would put away the excuses so that they can be equipped and trained so they can be more effective in the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for all of us in terms of our hearts, Father, and the things that we struggle with. Uh, Lord, things that might be weighing us down. Lord, I pray that we would give it all to you. And I pray that we would trust you, Father, knowing that you would bring about good in every situation. So, Father, we pray that you would go with us. Help us to always be mindful of you. And, Father, in all things, may we bring you honor and glory. For I ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.